Welcome to part two, where we're going to cover hot composting basics. And I love to start by introducing the diverse microorganisms that thrive in a compost pile. Actually, they're both micro and macro. So micro, you can't see basically with the naked eye. Macro, you can. Composting happens through their efforts. These are your volunteers. Your job is to make them happy. So what you've got is you've got fungi, bacteria, and other microbes that are feeding on your kitchen scraps, your leaves, your yard trimmings. And these are the first level decomposers that thrive in the compost pile. As these microorganisms consume materials, the pile's going to heat up. So this is important. It's the microorganisms consuming the materials and giving off heat as energy, which is how your pile gets hot. It's not from the sun. It's not from warm weather in the summer. It's from making these microorganisms happy. As your pile cools, it becomes inhabited by common soil microorganisms. These might be protozoa, worms, mites, insects, and then as other, and then and then other larger organisms feed on those, and they also begin to feed on the organic matter that's produced. And those are the second and the third degree decomposers. And really the whole process is teeming with life. Now the conditions in your pile can change depending on how active or passive a composter composter you are, but it's really this diversity of life that helps the process continue. So no matter what system you use or what size you are composting at, you need to know about the key ingredients for good compost. And that's going to be air, water, and the food. Just like us, those composting microbes need these things to survive and thrive. Composting is an, aer is an aerobic process. It needs oxygen. It's when it goes anaerobic, starved oxygen conditions that you can tend to get odor. So that's why getting oxygen into your pile is gonna be critical. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. We live on a carbon-based planet. So everything has some amount of carbon in it, but green materials, here in the context of composting refer to materials that are relatively high in nitrogen, whereas browns refer to materials that are relatively low in nitrogen. You might have heard about heard these terms. Basically, you can think of browns as materials that don't rot so easily. Think of plant stalks, woody plant stalks, or wood chips, or your fall leaves, right? Whereas your greens are more putrescible. They're going to rot more easily. Um, they have more moisture to release. In general, all organisms, including us humans, we need 25 to 30 times more elements of carbon than elements of nitrogen. Now that's on a dry chemical basis. That's kind of the element of carbon, right? And um, versus nitrogen, we need 25 to 30 times more. And our microbes need that too. So we need to supply them with the carbon and nitrogen in the right proportions in order for them to thrive. So if you have too much nitrogen in your compost pile, that excess nitrogen is converted to ammonia and you can have odor problems. So you never ever want more food scraps than your browns. You don't want more food scraps than your uh, leaves, your wood chips. In practice to to achieve this carbon to nitrogen ratio of 30, again, that's on a dry chemical basis, the general guideline is, is to add two to three times more browns by volume than your greens. So if you've got a big compost system that you might be thinking in wheelbarrows, or if you're at a community compost site, but it could be you know, a five gallon bucket, it could be your kitchen pail, but just kind of keep, keep that in mind. And you're gonna always need to have browns on hand and ready to use. You can't just compost your food scraps. You need to have those browns. And one of the reasons we're offering this um, workshop right now is fall has begun for many of us. And fall is a great time to start composting and to keep those, gather those leaves, don't put them out at the curb, and you're going to need them all year round. Okay, let's get into acceptable materials. What can you compost and what should you avoid? Okay, so the first thing um, is your 
just to go through the greens is we have your fruit and vegetable scraps. You want to leave off those, those fruit stickers if you can. They do not break down. You can put eggshells into your pile. I just recommend uh, just crushing them, grabbing them and crushing them because they won't break down otherwise. Uh, it takes a very long time. Coffee grounds, paper filters are fine. I tend to buy unbleached ones. I think they're preferable. You can put tea bags in your pile. Um, just rip out the staples if they have them or buy tea bags without staples and avoid the plastic tea bags. If you don't know whether it's plastic at the end of the process, you will know. They will not break down. You'll pick them out. And if you're going to add garden trimmings, like more of the, not the woody stalks, but the kind of green leaves, just, just chop it into six inches or smaller um, if you have some garden shears. The browns, fall leaves, plant stalks, wood chips and shavings. You can add some newspaper and brown bags. Don't ask, don't add glossy pages or magazines. And I do recommend you just kind of rip them. So it says here shredded newspaper and brown bags. As I mentioned, oxygen is important. So you don't want to put sheets of plas uh, sheets of paper. You don't want plastic either, but you don't want sheets of paper that's going to prevent the airflow th through your pile. Now, meat, dairy, oil, grease, cooked food, those increase the risk of attracting rodents. And also, one thing to note is rodents really cannot thrive off of fruit and vegetable scraps alone. They need a balanced diet that includes protein. So deny them that food and uh, deny them meat, dairy, and cooked human food. Also, these types of Materials tend to have a little bit more odor associated with them. They are compostable. Just want to emphasize, like, I do know people who compost them, but they know what they're doing. They're, they're tracking temperatures. If, you if you're lucky enough to be in an area that has curbside collection of food scraps, you may be able to put this in your bucket. It may be going to a commercial facility that's, or a municipal facility that's really tracking temperatures and doesn't have not an urban area with what I call rodent pressure, meaning there are rodents in your alleys, you know they're in your communities. If you have any doubt, leave anything out of your bin. You wanna to try to pick off those produce stickers. Like I said, they don't, they don't break down. Um, pet waste, glossy paper, treated or painted wood leave, leave out. Pet waste have a high likelihood of containing pathogens such as toxoplasmosis, which is um, prevalent in cat feces and can be extremely infectious. So as such, don't compost pet waste, especially if you, if you are new to composting or plan to use your compost to grow edible plants. Um, as a general rule, also avoid diseased or poisonous plants and aggressive weeds. If you keep weeding it from your garden, don't put it in your compost. Also, certain herbicides, um, uh, will persist through the composting process. So compost made with plants treated with herbicides may damage the plants you want to grow. So just uh, keep that in mind. And I actually think one of the benefits of home composting is that you can control what you're putting in your bin, which is a little harder at a community compost site. It's a little harder for municipal and commercial composters to exactly control. But we can. We can control what we put in there. Uh, avoid dryer lint. Um, Dryer lint, you know, let me just say, since most of our clothes are no longer made of natural materials or just cotton, you are likely going to introduce plastic or synthetic materials into the compost if you're adding dryer lint. Dryer lint is a source of uh, microplastics, and one source of that is our fleecy sweaters that, you know, it's great that they're made from recycled bottles, but they can uh, release microplastics from the washing process into the water. And, and so don't add lint. Used tissues, we've added to the list simply because no one wants to be handling someone else's used tissues, especially if that person may be sick. But for a home composter, that's really a personal preference. One thing I want to emphasize is you really want the clean, good stuff. Again, teach your housema housemates, your family members, when in doubt, to leave it out. And I'll say a word about compostable products. Um, compostable, even if products are labeled as compostable, um, they may not break down unless they're certified. 
The idea is that they're designed to break down in composting systems, but just because they're labeled as compostable doesn't mean that they will break down in your system, particularly if you're not reaching high temperatures. So just be, be careful of those and do look, if you're gonna be, you, you know, you have takeout, one of these takeout containers, if it's labeled as even commercially compost, compostable, it could break down in your home composting system. Um, but if it's not labeled, it could be coated with um, plastic. So this one was certified. This one looks like it might be compostable, but it's it's um, the one on the right. But it is um, it's uh, coated with plastic. So, and the other benefit of, of BPI certified products is um, that third party certification is helping to avoid certain chemicals and heavy metals. Uh, the new certification um, has some criteria for avoiding PFAS, which are known to be toxic and bioaccumulative. So just be careful of uh, putting in products labeled as compostable that aren't certified. And again, you'll hear this me say this, when in doubt, leave it out. Okay, so we've talked through the food for your microbes. Now let's talk about water and moisture. So composting, microbes live in a water layer around each of the material particles in our pile. And so they rely on that water to eat, move around, live. So they need a lot of water. And the ideal range is really, you know, 45 to 60%, 50% is even better. So another way to think about this is half the weight of your composting mix should be come from water. And it could be present in the food stocks, in your feedstocks and your materials going into the pile. That's what feedstock is. So if you're putting in your wet food scraps from your kitchen, that's a source of moisture. One thing to know is that often we build our piles and then we water afterwards. You wanna water as you're building your pile if it needs moisture, because again, you want that layer of moisture around each particle for those microbes. If you just water, after you built your pile, the water is just gonna run off your pile. It's not gonna be in your pile, okay? The other thing to think about is as your pile heats up, some of that moisture is gonna evaporate. So you wanna keep a close eye on the moisture content and you wanna make sure it's evenly distributed as much as possible through your pile. So if you've been composting and nothing's been happening in your pile, this could be one of your reasons. So regular turning and mixing can help with this. Um, and, you know, if your pile is, um, if the pile is too dry, your microbial activity is going to slow or cease. And if it's too wet, then you're going to lose those air pockets in the pile, the air spaces, which are key to the airflow. And then it's going to lead to those anaerobic conditions, meaning there won't be oxygen in your pile. So you don't want it too wet. It's got to be just right. Um, so how do you know when your moisture is 50 to 60 percent. Well, we teach this hand squeeze test. So when you're first building your pile and you want to see if the moisture is right, or if you're testing it halfway through to see if it's, you need to add more moisture, grab a handful of your pile and squeeze it, okay? And what you want is a few drops dripping between your knuckles. Some people say it feels like a wrung out uh, sponge, some people don't understand what that means. That's okay. You want a few drops dripping, but you, if, it, if you were to hold your hand up and it drips down your arm into your armpit, it is too wet. You don't need to do that, but sometimes we call this the armpit squeeze test. Um, but if you open your hand and it's very dry um, and you don't get any drops, then it's too dry and you consider adding water. Um, if it you also squeeze it and the materials kind of more or less stick together is also kind of what you want, or at least some of it, not all of it needs to stick together, okay? So that's one trick. One thing I think is one of the most important things I wanna leave you with today is that the secret of composting is oxygen, is air. And if you have one of these stationary piles or one in a, in a bin system, not a tumbler, um, you know, actually tumbling can do this too, but what turning does is it charges the material with fresh air. It distributes that moisture 
the nutrients, the organisms. It breaks up clumps of materials. It in invigorates and provides that burst of microbial activity. So pay attention to oxygen. It's a little harder in those tumblers because they, they do have holes, but sometimes the holes can be cleared. So when you're opening the hatch, you know, try to fluff it up inside and get oxygen in there because those tend to more easily get anaerobic than other systems. The other thing I'll just mention is do pay attention to density. When we have a very long, uh, you know, a longer uh, training session, we can teach you more about the density you're aiming for and how to measure density, which we don't have time today. But you don't want your pile to become too compressed or dense because then it'll lose its airspace. So pitchfork can be your best friend. Um, Sometimes we put those fall leaves in and they are wet and matted like this, and they that may block the airflow. The same can go with like cardboard and paper that I mentioned earlier. You don't want just a sheet of that. So break up those clumps of leaves, rip the paper into strips, cut up the plant stalks like those shown on the left. You know, it doesn't have to be cut up into fine pieces, just like six, six inch, eight inches pieces. And that's going to just help the air flowing through the pile. So I want to really leave you with this thought that you can home compost at what le whatever level of effort you would like to, whatever suits you. You don't need to track temperatures if you don't want to. If you don't do hot composting, you won't be optimizing conditions for your microbes. Know that it will be slower. Your system will fill up faster because it's not breaking down as quickly. Um, if you do pay attention to oxygen and moisture and kind of balancing your browns and greens it's and you're turning your pile, then it's going to be faster and it's going to be quicker. The other benefit is that um, reaching high temperatures is going to prevent those weed seeds from germinating. So you're going to kill the weed seeds and you're going to reduce any risk of pathogens, okay? But passive or cold is fine too. If you're a dump and run person, just make sure you're always covering your food scraps. Now, this chart shows on the bottom kind of days of decomposition decomposition, 40 days and beyond, and then the temperature, we're in Fahrenheit here, so 80 to 160 degrees. And it kind of just shows how turning can speed up the process. By turning the pile, you're charging that material with fresh air, um, uh, as I mentioned, and so there's many benefits. And you can see if you're turning during the first few weeks, every three days, you will get to above 140 degrees. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about tracking temperatures. There are these temperature probes you can buy. In the U.S., they run about $40 to $50. Um, and they will show you in the 80 to like um, 130 degrees is steady, active, kind of more slow composting. Above 130 um, to 160 is kind of really hot. You really want to be the sweet spot if you want to get hot, is really that 110 to 155 degrees. That's that's the desired range where you're destroying the risk of pathogens, fly larva, the weed seeds. You need 145 degrees to kill most weed seeds or prevent them from germinating. Tomatoes take higher. It's more like 153 degrees, which is why we often have um, uh, tomato plants growing in our compost pile. But 131, which is almost where this thermometer is right now, is what you need to kill human pathogens. So, and you need to be at that temperature for three consecutive days, okay? And the composting process is what produces the heat. And again, the heat drives off the moisture. So you want to manage, manage that. Okay, I just want to share that for those of you who are interested in using a temperature uh, get, you know, to track the process. The temperature is really a great way to see what's going on. But I will tell you, uh, another option is your nose. As we say, the nose knows. So if you're smelling a, a bad odor, you know, something that really is noxious, that is a sign that something is wrong and you need maybe more browns, you need more oxygen, uh, maybe less water. So the nose knows, and that can will be your guide. Now, composting does have a smell, but it shouldn't be something that's um, 
you know, really a nuisance or, or noxious. So keep, keep that in mind.